Hi und willkommen zu diesem neuen Video auf meinem Kanal. Mein Name ist Aaron und ich heiße euch herzlich willkommen zur zweiten Folge meines neuen Formats Bücherjäger Meets. Ich bin sehr stolz, dass Penelope Hughes zu Gast ist, die Autorin von 10 Jahre du und ich. Wir haben über verschiedene Themen rund um dieses Buch gesprochen, rund um das Schreiben. Und das Ganze fand auf Englisch statt. Ihr werdet aber die ganze Zeit deutsche Untertitel sehen, damit es auch wirklich jeder und jeder versteht. Ich freue mich natürlich immer über Feedback in den Kommentaren, keine Frage. Also wenn es da irgendwas gibt, schreibt es mir gerne, schreibt es mir gerne in die Kommentare. Und ähm, es gibt aber eine kleine kurze Spoilerwarnung. Wir haben in einem Teil ein kleines bisschen über den Inhalt des Buches gesprochen. Wirklich nur ein bisschen. Das könnte jeder schauen, ohne sich großartig zu spoilern. Aber wenn doch, schaut hier gerne mal in die Leiste ähm, mit den Kapiteln. Dort könnt ihr einfach die kleine Spoilerwarnung überspringen. Und dann, ähm, und dann seht ihr da gar nichts. Das Buch findet ihr natürlich als Affiliate Link zu Thalia in der Infobox, falls ihr es euch kaufen wollt. Und dann wünsche ich euch ganz, ganz herzlich viel Spaß mit diesem Video. Pernal, so nice uh, to meet you. Um, thank you for being on my show. Um, would you just mind to to tell me and tell tell all the others who are watching us now um, who you are? So uh, I'm Penelope Hughes. I'm a uh, romance writer for HarperCollins, an imprint of HarperCollins called One More Chapter here in the UK. And um, I have written three books to date. Um, the newest of which has come out uh, in this last month. It's called uh, Ten Years, which looks like this in yes. this country. This but in Germany, it's called Sin Ja Du und Ich, uh, which you have there. Brilliant. I don't need to yes, wave my course. Um, and so I am, well, I'm primarily a mum of four children, um, teenagers now. Uh, but while they are out, I write books. And um, that's that's what you've you've got there. Okay, great. Um, maybe you can tell us just just a bit um, what this this book, your new book, is about, just without spoilers for those who haven't read it yet. Oh, sure. So, um, Zehn Jahre Du und Ich is a um, an enemy, a, a funny, slow burn, enemies to lovers story, uh, which spans 10 years, uh, and it roams from London to Snowdonia's mountains, um, to from Brighton to Cannes in France, as Charlie and Becca uh, are looking to complete a bucket list for a loved one, but they hate each other. That's the story. So how's the feedback so far from the UK and from Germany? Oh, uh, both have been amazing. The German uh, readers had it uh, oh, two weeks before the, the UK launch and the bloggers have been amazing. The um, the DTV uh, Verlag sent out blogger packs uh, with challenges about bucket lists and writing to loved ones and doing something that uh, challenged you and if they then posted those to Instagram and I got to see them and it was just the most lovely lovely thing and and generally well certainly the the um, posts that I saw were very flattering and very lovely and everyone has enjoyed it uh, but for me it was seeing people they had a go at things, you know, people were trying challenges that specifically things that were putting them out of their comfort zone, um, which really moved me. Some of them were so touching. So really, people have engaged with the book. Um, and so in the UK here, my first two books, uh, one is called Punch Drunk Love and the other is called Probably the Best Kiss in the World. Um, and they're quite, they're light uh, rom-coms, proper uh, rom-coms. And this book here, because it does deal with grief, is um, not darker, but a little bit heavier. And it does start with a funeral, which is not common for a rom-com or a, a humorous romance. Um, so it's not necessarily what people were expecting from me, but it's not. It's still my voice. It's not a million miles away. And uh, the feedback has been just amazing. It has been so touching. Uh, people really engaging with two characters who are actually quite spiky at the beginning and, and then, you know they properly don't like each other and so some people found that quite bristly to read um in if they were expecting something lighter but then as we go through the book we find out why they're like that and then hopefully within you know taking real rounded characters and seeing why they're quite messy then people have been along for the ride which has been great are there any any differences you recognize in reviews between Germany and the UK? Um, no, what has been lovely actually is because of course you have the translated version and the translation has been done by the lovely Lena Kaus, 
Um, and so obviously I don't get to check that because my German is not is is, is school German. And um, what has been really lovely to see in a lot of the reviews, uh, the uh, reviewers are saying how fluid it is and um, the writing style. And of course, that's you know the words she's picked, the, the way she's put, changed the sentences has so has been done so skillfully um so that's been really pleasing and of course is um is a different way of looking at it than the way that the, the uk or the english language review would be because they wouldn't necessarily be looking at the fluidity of the language rather than for me i suppose it's with pace um but so that has been really gratifying to see how the fluidity of the language has carried over i know there's not quite as many swear words in the german version um but you know, if you've enjoyed the German version, perhaps, and you want all the swear words, maybe pick up the English version. <laughs> um, well, you already told, uh, told us that um, well, one part of the book is that Ali Ali dies quite yes. quite in the beginning of the book, and there's a funeral, um, which is, as you told us, um, pretty pretty, uh, yeah, not really typical for for rom coms. Um, so why did you choose to to yeah start the story like this? Good question, because it, it really felt like a gamble. Um, so there's a little prologue where we get to know Ali very briefly and other people went, oh, that was a real sucker punch. But it had to be like that because I needed very, very quickly for people to understand Charlie and Ali's love because they were engaged. I needed them to see what, what kind of a person she was and then I needed them to see the loss. And then following it up by the funeral where we have Charlie and Becky, uh, Becca at the funeral. Becca is Ali's best friend and um, they're both at the funeral to take part. And we needed to see very, very early on how much of a loss Ali is to them because I didn't want Ali's story to be the whole of this book. This book is about Charlie and Becca growing through the years, changing from enemies to lovers. I mean, it's a, it's a romance, this is not predictable this is this is what romance does isn't it? so it's not a, it's not a spoiler um but how we get there is obviously the journey and so it was really i needed to smack you in the face very quickly so that you could understand how important ali was to them but also what a shock the whole thing was so um well, you you say you write rom coms, so so a bit a bit of a humorous touch is sure. what you want to bring into your books, into your stories. Um, how do you think is, is is humor a good a good tool to just deal with a with the death of a beloved person? Well, for me, I can't write straight. I I just I've tried writing straight things. My humor will always come into it, and so for this book. When dealing with grief, it's that light and shade thing. You can't have light without shade and vice versa. And also, I think when I finished my last book, which was called Probably the Best Kiss in the World, uh, there was um, this, there's an element in it where somebody says all magic comes at a price. And which I think I got from a TV series called uh, Once Upon a Time. Uh, but and there I was there. The magic was love. And so that was still sitting with me as I started this new book. It's like, how what would the price be for this love? And really, the price is that both Becca and Ali, no, Becca and Charlie, they pr paid up front because they lost their best person. And so, again, it was like, see that way. But then equally, I think love and laughter goes together. And that's why I write that. And so in order to if I was going to show their pain, I then also needed to show the love they had, but also funny things. And also, if you're writing an enemies to love a story, there has to be some even no matter how much they hate each other, there needs to be a, a common point, little things they might do for each other without necessarily realizing it. But also, for me, the commonality was they laugh at the same thing. So they uh, yeah, if you can laugh with a partner, you could be the most opposite of partners. But if, if at the same thing, there's something that both tickles you, you know, that is a good sign, in, in my opinion. Uh, so really, the humour came in to make uh, the grief story bearable. 
uh, just to amuse and keep the pace because it's spanning 10 years. There's got to be some funny things going on in there to keep keep you going. Um, but also to show that actually underneath all of the bickering and the banter, they share a sense of humour. And that ha there has to be some shared point between these two people who supposedly hate each other. Mm -hmm. Becca and Becca and Charlie, who are the enemies at um, at the beginning of the book, and just find e find each other um, on on their way on uh, yeah due to these these ten years, um, they are pretty di pretty different, um, yes. especially at the beginning, and they just just seem to to not really not really be on the same same side on on many many Absolutely. topics in fact they rub each other up the wrong way deliberately they have over the years got to the point of behaving quite childishly about really you know um you know when you have siblings who fight they love each other and when but they still fight and they push each other's buttons and they do it deliberately to get in there first and so these two behave like this and then gradually you know, as, as they grow, some of that goes, uh, but then also because they know each other better than many other, you know, other people know them, they kind of know what each other needs. And so they bring out the best in each other as well as the worst in each other. And setting it up with, from a writing point of view, if you're going to do Enemies to Lovers, it, the simplest way to do that is to have two very opposite people. Uh, it instantly gives conflict and um, bickering and so for them to then um, come together to do these tasks, which I deliberately picked things that would uh, push their buttons as well, uh, that that's just going to make uh, fighting and uh, not, you know, we're not punching, but we're kind of just needling at each other, which is really what I wanted to really bring in at the beginning so that it, gradually we can see the change in them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, many many readers who want to want the characters to develop on in the book, and now you you wrote a story which is about uh, which yeah which lasts ten years, which yeah. is a very very long time for for, for a book. Yeah. And and so obviously in in ten years, and Becca and and, and Charlie start uh, being being young people. Um, get an older ten years, so they develop. So maybe I don't know. Can you can you just take take us with you on the way from from a year one to year ten? How do you, as an author, develop such such people? Do you do it um, before you start writing, or is it just in the process? I think it really was in the process for me. I what I, the way I structured this book because, as you say, ten years is a long time. Uh, the main bulk of what happens is in the first eight of those 10 years um, and I can't just write you know 10 years of stuff of every single thing that happens because that would be a very very long book and also quite boring <laughs> so we have to jump between the years and I have to give you enough information so that you can see what's happened to them without going through every single thing they've done for every 10 years and I trust the reader that they are able to make that jump with me um, so far that seems to have been mainly the case um, so the way I structured it is that um, apart from the first year where we have the funeral um, then the the, the um, and they go apart they, they part ways as far as they're concerned they never need to speak to each other again after this funeral we then bring them back a year later because Ali has scheduled an email uh, near where she thinks will be the anniversary of her death, asking her, them to come and see her mother to check that Valerie is OK, which of course they do because they love Valerie. Um, but they're not, you know, thrilled about seeing each other. So the way I've then done it is that I've, um, for each year, there's one chapter which deals with what's happened in the last year. Um, we see them now and what's happened in the last year. And then the second chapter is the actual task. Um, and that way, each time we and each year is alternating whose point of view it is. So the funeral is in Charlie's point of view, but then the next task uh, when they meet up again is in Becca's point of view. So we get to see both sides, but springing from year to year and two chapters per year. And that meant that I could then break it down again as to what's happened in their life. And naturally, then I think it came in the process of me having just realizing how they may have grown a little bit got wiser 
Um, Becky's a bit slower at getting wiser, I've got to admit, but you know, she's trying. <laughs> she she has had a hard life, Becca. She is a uh, aspiring actress. And whereas she is kind of getting the jobs, they're rubbish acting jobs. She is the, the corpse in a murder. She is in the uh, Comic Cons in the Princess Leia outfit, handing out flyers. She's sort of, she was in acting, but she's not catching her breaks. So she takes longer to mature, um, which of course brings its own fights later on. Uh, but again, it was about keeping the momentum between them at the same time as allowing their maturing to help each other as we went along. So was it planned? Very, very sketchily in block kind of forms, but nothing too meticulous because a lot, after I'd set the structure of the book, it just had to come as it came out of my head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, in the writing process, you spend so much time with the book characters you, you yes. just created with, um, obviously uh, Becca and Charlie as the main characters and um, so now when you talk about them it's like it's it's almost like you're talking about real people um, do you have something like a favorite character in your in your book in this book in 10 years yeah. no I love all of my children equally <laughs> no I mean I think there is our they do sit with you for a long time and these ones sat with me during the first lockdown uh during the pandemic and so you know that was also a very strange time to be writing especially trying to write funny things when the world is not a funny place i found that quite difficult so them being quite messy characters while i am very fond of them and love them i can certainly see them for their flaws and they are very flawed definitely but i i see that as being real we i, I read you know there's many characters who are fun but would you think they were real not always um and what we wanted here were two messy flawed characters and um but i do particularly like also uh valerie who um uh, ali's mother who is a minx uh she could be quite naughty and um there as well, it was like bringing in an, another element of grief. You know, it's not just about Charlie and Becca missing their friend. It's also about a mother who has lost their daughter. Um, and then also Ollie, who is um, Charlie's best friend, who just drops him in, in the crap uh, a lot. But inadvertently, he doesn't know he's doing it. He's just a that charming friend who you can forgive everything, but will always, always uh, get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. um when you when you're done writing your book when you you have your your final manuscript um i mean before you before you publish it of there are of course many many people reading it um editors for example but who yeah. are persons you you want the books to read before they are published um so you get a, a real opinion from from people you you like you love i don't know so nowadays now that I have a pub, uh, my publisher, this book here was very much between me and the editor, uh, Charlotte, um, as much because we came up with a lot of it together at the very, very beginning. Um, and then it was just between her and I. I have now uh, people I call early readers who will be a few of my family members and a friend in the States. Um, and that's just really, I would perhaps send them three chapters. Uh, my friend in the States, I'll send her three chapters and I'll say, at the end of this chapter, what can you tell me? And she will just list everything that she she can remember and tell me. And then I can kind of see what have I not said enough of, what's confusing, because she'll say what she's confused by. So I will know to go back and actually within, if I can't set it up within three chapters so that people know what's going on, it needs more work. Um, my, uh, who else? So, you know, yeah, for this book, it was definitely my editor because I was because it was different. It was, you know, a, a less light book. I was less confident and I was uh, feeling my way. I would send her the first I sent her the first half, I think. No, the first three chapters and a middle chapter to say, is the tone right? Uh, this is where it's going to go to in the middle. This is going to happen in between them. And I haven't written those chapters yet. What do you think? And then she came back and she just went, keep going, keep going. You've got this. At which point it was to carry on to the end. And I wasn't ready to show anyone at all what that looked like until uh, Charlotte and I had got it to a point where it was um, workable. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not that person who can send a really, my first draft I call a vomit draft because it is just me throwing words <clears throat> out. Um, and then there's the official first draft that I probably still wouldn't show to anyone because I'm still working it through. Um, so really maybe Charlotte would see the second draft when things have been taken out, new things put in. She'll then come back to me and say, this bit's not working. You don't need this bit. Want to see more of this. In this book's case, she came back and there's one scene where she just went, this is hilarious, but it's too gross for romance. So I had to wind that one back in. But that's if you have a good editor who you trust, then you can throw everything at the page. You don't hold back. You don't second guess. You really give it everything. And their job is then to rein it in and you trust them to then say less of, less of this or more of that. Um, but that's your your relationship with your editor, which is crucial. And even if you're, whether you're self-publishing or not, your editor is worth the money or should be worth the money. And, and you must have an editor. You can't, I don't believe you can self-edit. You are so close to your words. You love every one of them. You have sweated them out. And so to cut out big chunks hurts. And actually it's better to have a fresh pair of eyes that will say, this bit isn't unnecessary or it's, you know, it, it, I don't know what you're trying to say here, but you need to either lose it or work harder at it. And whereas I may sulk for a day after those notes, I will then the next day think, OK, let's let's have a go at that. And, 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 and it will always be better for it. Always. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you ever considered um, writing books in another genre than, than um, rom-com? Um, so for me, it would always have to be funny because I, I can't not. Um, so really, I think the only place I could look at was Cozy Crime. Uh, I don't know what that's called in German, but you know, the, the Midsummer kind of, uh, and Richard Osman and those kind of um, nicer crime books. But I'm not very good at plotting. So or it hurts me to plot. So I think with a crime novel, you really need to know, I, don't, I would probably need to know all the, have a really good plan as to how we get there and where the where the clues are and where the red herrings are. And and I just, I don't think I've got that. I don't think I've got the brain for that. One day I might try, but I need to write some more rom-coms actually, I think. So yeah. you think you, you uh, writing, uh, writing other, other books, um, these, these crime books, you, you couldn't develop your story together with yourself and your characters? I, I'm too chicken at the moment. I haven't dared try it. I think uh, I would, I would, I would need to read up about how do you plan out a good crime uh, novel. I would need to have a good idea as to who who's solving these crimes. And at the moment, there's a lot of different ones coming out at the moment here in the UK. Uh, so you need to have something original there. Um, so it's tinkering in my head, um, but it's not right for now. What, what genres do you read? Uh, so I read romance, uh, but I also read... Uh, Crime. I listen a lot to crime on uh, audiobook. Uh, I can't really listen to romance on audiobook so well, but crime novels I can. Um, and uh, some historicals as well. I like, uh, there's there's some books which are, are series that I really like, which are historical crime. So back, set back in Roman times. Those are amazing because that's so, you know, it's Roman social history at the same time. I, I like social history. Um, but equally, there's another series I'm really into, which is uh, crime set in Amish country in America. Love those. Um, other funny crime, like uh, Janet uh, Ivanovich, amazing, funny. Um, so, yeah, there are others out there who I would like to really emulate, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, I'd like to be uh, UK Janet Ivanovich. That would be fantastic. <laughs> uh, but I just have to come up with some ideas and write the books and um, easy. Yeah. So would you say you have you have like like role models you you just just books you read from from different authors um, who are real role models for you who who have a style you'd like to you'd like to have too besides Ivanovich? Yeah. So when I started out and realised that it took me a while to work out that women's fiction was where I should be writing, I started by writing um, for children uh, or wanting to write for children because. Um, quick very quick history of me is that I was working at a company who made Teletubbies and uh, I was in the international rights department there and then I had 
four babies within five years and I couldn't afford to work anymore the childcare would be too much so I was at home my brain was shrinking I thought I, I've always wanted to write and I'm, I'm maybe a children's book because I've been working with children and uh, so I did a course a correspondence course while the children the baby slept and um, I had I wrote the, uh, novelty books uh, you know the card the really thick card books with touchy-feely uh, fabrics and things in that babies have um, so t I had two of those options, which was very exciting. Um, but then the 2008 recession happened and that publishing company decided to not do any more of the expensive novelty books. Uh, so I tried some picture books and I would start sending them in because actually, you know, they were being rejected, but I was getting nice comments back. And so I could see I had something. And then I wrote um, a middle grade book just to see if I could write. Uh, how many words was that? Maybe 50,000 words as a challenge. And then I wrote a young adult book. Again, nice rejections, but that was 70,000 words just to see, can I do that? And then I, um, we had a newspaper, have a newspaper called the Sunday Times and they have a travel um, section. Within travel section, there was a little column called uh, Confessions of a Tourist, a little 650 words of, you know, finding somebody on a holiday. So I started writing those and I had 36 of those bought by the by the newspaper, which was amazing, you know, that somebody liked my writing. And then I saw on Twitter uh, a competition for a um, an anthology of women's fiction short stories called Sun Lounger. And they had three spaces. Well, everyone was published except for three spaces that would um, a competition for unpublished writers. And I thought, OK, I'll have a go at that 5000 words short story. And I came runner up and that was very slow to work out. That was where my writing voice lay and I should be writing women's fiction. And then I had to write a full length book. So that's how I got there. And I think even if it's my, my writing voice is what makes my writing mine. And I will have and I found my kind of voice by reading uh, books by, say, Varim Farlan, uh, Lindsay Kelk. Jenny Colgan, um, because until then I hadn't really realised that I could write as I speak, you know, and 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 that there's a there's a, a tone to that kind of writing, and so from there I wasn't trying to copy them, but I think it was an awareness that yeah you can have books published, popular books published, by writing as you speak, and so that's kind of where I've kind of pitched my. So you've had much practice um, over the last the last years in writing and writing books and um, and yeah just creating a story. Um, yeah. Do you have like I don't know? Do, do you know? Can can you tell what's what's what makes a good story? What makes a good book for you as an author or for you as a reader? Yeah, I'm gradually getting there, and it means that my husband now hates watching television programs with me because after <laughs> that was not a satisfying character arc. And this is how they should have done that. And they brought that in too early. And I think he now hates it. But the thing is that I always advise writers, new writers to read a book twice, read it as a reader. So you get the story and, and the joy of it, but then read it as a writer and think about what are they doing here? What's happening at the end of this chapter that makes you want to turn the page to the next chapter? Is the character arc satisfying? Because you can have messy character flaws, you know, flaws and all at the beginning of your book, but they have to be changed by the end of that story or else you don't have a story. You know, they can't be the same. Um, no, lessons have to be learned. Uh, changes have to be made. Uh, apologies made where necessary. Um, and for me, that is something that I have. I learned so much writing my first book, the things we took out, the things we added in. Um, and then hopefully I try to bring those to the next book and then what I learn in the second book I bring to the next one. And that can be good and bad in that sometimes, you know, I've learned so much, but at the same time that vomit draft is such a fragile thing. It, you know, that's why no one else will ever see it. But then to bring all this knowledge that, you know, and I want to be efficient, I want to bring it all and it just can't cope with that weight that needs to come in the next draft really where I can then see the mess and then try to work out um where is this arc and sometimes and this happens all, often is that you tell yourself the story in that first draft and only by the end do you really realize what this book is actually about 
um, the theme of it. It may not be clear. Some people know at the beginning, lovely, be nice to be them. Uh, but sometimes you get right three quarters of the way through and go, oh, it's not about that. It's about this. And that can just change the whole of your book. And then you can go back and you can add in clues or you can add in uh, things that illustrate your point. And when you know what your theme is, it will make your uh, chapters far clearer to the reader as well. And those are all things that I've learned as I've gone. But I've also learned sometimes you have to be patient. And believe me, I am not a patient person. You have to wait for things to show themselves in your writing sometimes. And that could be from really small scale. I'm writing. I can't remember what the word is for something. I'll just write XX. I know it will come to me maybe in five minutes or tomorrow. But I just write XX and keep going. Equally, the theme may come after three months and then we can go back and repractice. <laughs> you you already told us about your former jobs, for example, for for television, for the, the company behind behind uh, the Teletubbies. Um, do you think or how much do you think do your former jobs influence your your today's uh, writing style? I mean, in um, in 10 years, Cinegal und ich, um, there is um, one one chapter at the the Cannes Fe Film Festival. Yeah, um, so, which... so the Cannes Television Festival. It's not the film festival, which is the really special ah, it's a... one. Ah, okay, okay, yeah, sure. The festival, which happens twice a year, once in March and once in October. And I used to go to those festivals. Now that had two uh, two reasons. It's there. Firstly. When I planned out the book and was planning the bucket list items, I had to pick things that were um, difficult for them in as far as, if, you know, when you write bucket lists, if, what, people go, oh, I want to see the Northern Lights or I want to travel to Asia. And those would be very expensive things for Becca, who has no money to do. But also they'd be nice things. And then they're, they're just going to have a nice time. And I don't want them to have a nice time. I want them to have a... A, a difficult time so I had to pick things that were more at home and that possibly I could research as well because I don't have a research budget to travel far far away um, and as that happened the pandemic happened I couldn't go anywhere anyway so I did a lot of uh, research on YouTube um, to, to, you know, to, to follow to, to look at details um, and then it came to this chapter where I need them to be to meet not because of the bucket list. And because they're both within television, I actually thought, well, why don't I, I can't go anywhere, but I know can, and I know the MIT TV Festival and the MIPCOM Festival, I'll write about that. So I placed them there. I, I, you know, it's been some years since I've been, it may have changed, but to my best of my memory, that's how it, it felt and how it was. Um, but other things I had to, Uh, so, so from a TV point of view, those are um, practical ways that I've kind of used it. Uh, vis I think I see my scenes quite visually. Maybe that's come from the TV, uh, working in TV, but I think it may come as much because I did a degree in uh, film and literature where I was watching. I read books and read watched films for three years, which was great. Um, and, and so I see things quite visually um, as well. So maybe that had an impact as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'd like to like to introduce a topic which just came came to my mind yep. um, and which is maybe a bit or yeah, a bit, bit, bit hard to, to answer in the end, uh, but we'll we'll try. Um, mm -hmm. The influence of an, of an author um, on their books or Of, of, of artists on their art in, in general um, is, is huge, obviously. And um, what's in, in inside the author's mind um, could, could always, um, always influence what the author writes. So um, there's this big question. I don't know if it's a huge topic in the UK, to be honest, but in, in Germany it is. So can you, um, can you read the, the books of problematic authors like for example JK Rowling who who seems to to um, have like like transphobic tra transphobic um, opinions which she uh, which she um, told told the world on Twitter um do you have a, a, a opinion about that not currently because I've been busy <laughs> so, <laughs> I think 
I don't know. I don't. I try not to get into the politics of the writing. If I'm mm -hmm. brutally honest, I mean, I have, I have read um, the. I think your book has to stand by itself. When I write a book and I put my book out, from the point where I've released it, it's kind of not mine anymore. It belongs. It belongs to the readers. So all the reviews happen. You judge the book. Um, if people find you know that they don't want to read a book about me for some reason that's their choice don't you know don't pay for the book don't uh, don't read the book that's I, I have no say over that um i would say the book stands by itself uh if if the books have given joy to people in the past i would I, you know can you really turn around and say it means nothing to me now and i think well does it doesn't it i, I don't know and i think as another writer I, I I just had to I haven't really delved into that and that's probably not a very good answer that's probably a, a, a poor answer uh, I, I just think the books should be judged by themselves mm -hmm. um, I think there are many things where at the moment it's, the focus is on books but there will have been things that were made in the past by all sorts of people not just women because I think the women are getting quite a kicking at the moment uh, where actually if we'd looked at the man uh, who had invented that thing that could have been an awful person. Would you then not use the invention? You know, I think there's sometimes, sometimes there's other things kind of playing uh, as to where we give focus and why we give it focus. Um, and it all feels very problematic. And as a fellow writer, you know, it's difficult to really get into. But, you know, I, th I think it's everything's so divided, you can't win one way or the other. That was a really not great answer for you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. OK. Um... So for for an good and for a pleasurable and I'd like to like to um yeah talk about a quote I found on your website which is sure. I'm a I'm a firm believer that love and laughter go hand in hand. Why is that? Yes, yes, I I do believe that. I think that, and maybe that's just from my experience, but I think that a couple uh, or you know in a relationship, if you can laugh with the other person, it can take you through so much. It can be uh, for all your different. My husband and I are on paper, very different people. And there were people when we met who went, well, that's not going to last. You know, it just made very little sense. But the fact is that we have always laughed at the same things. And here we are 30 years later and still laughing at the same things. And we still make each other laugh. And I think there are some things in life, you know, your values and, and in, you know, where your integrity lies. But laughter, which is such a uh, spontaneous thing and difficult to truly fake, um, I think if your if your partner shares that laughter, I think it's a really firm, sound foundation. And so to write love stories for me without my characters being able to laugh together just would not ring true, not as something that would endure and last. Does that kind of make sense to you? Yeah, it absolutely does, and I think that's a, a wonderful ending. And I'm I'm very very happy that um you you were a guest on my on my show. Actually, oh, the pleasure. in 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 uh, for, from for me it's the first the first recording of this show. Um, it's you're actually the first guest, but um you you this 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 episode will be published as the second one. And um I was uh, very very happy, or I am very very happy. Um, that you, well, I couldn't you tell had it was time for me. You, you've got this like really damn pat, which is great. Really, thank you for having me. Great. Thank you so much. Das war sie also die zweite Folge meines Formats Bücherjäger Meet mit Pernil Hughes. Ich hoffe sehr, dass euch das Video gefallen hat. Ich hoffe, dass das alles hingehauen hat mit den Untertiteln, dass nicht zu so viele Rechtschreibfehler drin waren. Ich hatte keine Zeit mehr, sie zu kontrollieren, aber das sollte einigermaßen hinhauen. Und natürlich freue ich mich sehr über Feedback in den Kommentaren. Hier kommt ihr zur ersten Folge des Formats mit Tanja vom Kanal Miss Drunken Cherries Bücherstapel. Und ich freue mich natürlich immer über euer Abo und einen Daumen nach oben. Und ich wünsche euch noch einen ganz, ganz wunderbaren Tag. Bis bald.